thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my work. Uh, this is um, the paper that I'm presenting is, is part of my dissertation and it will be a little challenging to um, within 15 minutes to, um, to express everything that I want to say. So uh, hopefully during the uh, question and answer uh, session I'll have a chance to elaborate on, on some of the um, issues that I want to bring in. Um, so uh, following from Andres' one of the Andres' presentations, I'm also interested in, in spaces of experience and possibilities for changing and shifting um, meanings of identity. So I think this is a, a kind of a, a nice follow-up uh, to this paper. But at the same time, I want to uh, take a step back and uh, frame my project, um, not just for the conference, but in general, um, with one very simple uh, distinction. Um, uh, I, I like to look at um, uh, the interactions between states and migrants uh, from, from the very simple point of view where migrants are defined by um, their um, desire and movement, uh, usually a circular movement, and uh, the state is defined famously by um, the capacity and the authority to, to control movement of people and, and control territories. So this is kind of a very basic premise that, <coughs> that drives my work. Um, there has been a lot of research already done as to um, migrants' capacity nowadays to challenge uh, the authority of the state and to um, seek for um, ways of inclusion, justice, uh, uh, granting of rights. But to me, this conversation of, of inclusion and um, uh, ability to, to <coughs> access rights, to ability to access recognition, um, reduces the possibility, reduces the practices of, of the migrant, reduces the migrant to some version of, of um, state-assigned category of immigrant, refugee, uh, asylee, traffic person, whatever you want. And from there on, the um, uh, conversation about um, having or not having rights automatically becomes a conversation which is um, uh, rights granted by the state or rights granted by some already existing institution. And I want to move away from that conversation because, uh, again, if we think of migrants as people who are driven by the desire for movement, that does not necessarily mean a desire for settlement, does not necessarily mean um, uh, movement from point A to point B. And again, in, in my broader research, I draw on a lot of historical, particularly historical research on migrant circulations um, for many, many centuries. And of course, um, you can say today uh, such possibilities are rather limited because of the, of the form of the nation state. But at the same time, uh, with my work, I'm trying to, to say that uh, perhaps migrants have to contest, uh, have, have ways to contest that as well. So what I will, uh, the ways that I, I um, conceptualize uh, migrants' possibility to contest and to create different forms of, of um, uh, association and different uh, forms of alternative realities, um, I uh, structure around four points that I will explain today. Number one, um, the capacity to invent, assert, and enact identities. Number two, uh, subversion and use of power against power's own design. Number three, um, uh, uh, temporality and unsettlement of locations, unsettlement of settlement. And number four, uh, challenge to sovereign authority. So um, the way I uh, will walk you through these four different concepts is by first taking you to um, an ancient term um, that has been used randomly um, in kind of contemporary literature um, because there's pretty much no good translation in English for the term and it also has a lot of meanings and that term is uh, metis. Uh, it's a Greek word 
um, that um, is again has a lot of different associations that are today used as um, cunning intelligence, practical knowledge, um, a cunning ability for transformation, um, many, many different versions. I, uh, I like to use it within the, the sphere of transformation and um, ingenuity, um, cleverness. But again, I will um, show you with my presentation uh, how uh, some ways in which methods operate. So, um, conveniently for me, um, uh, in order to show you how METIS works, I also can take you back to somebody that I arguably use as the, one of the most ancient of migrants, and that's Odysseus. Uh, of course, we can um, talk a lot about whether Odysseus is really a migrant in the modern sense of the world, but um, for me, Odysseus is a migrant because he's, throughout the story, he's always presented as a person on the moon, and also he's always presented as a person who needs to negotiate his entry and presence on, on a in a particular territory. He's usually always an other, a stranger of some sort that needs to contest uh, his place of existence within that territory. So, um, um, right into the uh, world of the Odyssey, and immediately I will show you um, one of the, the uses of the word uh, metis, um, and for those of you who who cannot remember very well the stories here. Uh, basically, Odysseus uh, is very curious. He goes to the island of the Cyclops, um, eats and drinks from the Cyclops' uh, milk, you know, eats the sheep of the Cyclops. So, of course, the Cyclops is angry and, and starts eating uh, Odysseus's plumage. So, um, Odysseus has to devise, this, uh, devise a plan to uh, rescue himself and his crewmen from the Cyclops, and conveniently he has this uh, powerful wine that uh, gets um, the Cyclops to fall asleep, um, and he pierces his uh, Cyclops eye. Um, so this is uh, the picture you see here is right from uh, piercing the Cyclops eye. Um, what is interesting about the story is that right before uh, giving the Cyclops the wine, um, Cyclops says, oh, so tell me your name, um, you stranger and trespasser, tell me your name. And Odysseus says, my name is nobody. So when um, the Cyclops uh, is with a pierced eye already and cries for, for help for the other Cyclops to come and rescue him uh, and help him out find the trespasser, they ask him, so who pierced your eye? And he says, nobody pierced me. Right. So this is um, kind of the, uh, a very brilliant way um, to show you how Metis allows a contender to change his identity and all, all also to make it a, a non-traceable identity, identity that you cannot uh, find out what it is. Uh, nobody can be anybody. The Cyclops does not know what he's looking for, who he is after. Um, Drawing on, on this exa example of identity reformulation, and then in my research look into a completely different set of uh, migrants. Um, the migrants who are usually excluded from um, a specific environment. And in this case, and through this uh, several images here, um, I'm, I will show you how um, exclusion works against the Chinese end of 19th century, beginning of the 20th century in the United States. So um, I'll let these images speak for themselves. Uh, this is um, a trade card that um, people were collecting when they were buying poison for their guts. Uh, this is a, a child toy gun, which is called Kill a Chinaman. Um, and this is a recreation of, of Statue of Liberty uh, in the San Francisco Harbor, um, you can't read the kind of the race, but it says labor, white, ruin, uh, disease, uh, immorality, and filth. Um, so basically, um, I use the Chinese as, as the limit case of migrants who are 
completely excluded from uh, from the United States. I will not walk into the the legal um, side of it, but of course there's the Chinese exclusionary laws. So the Chinese use a similar tactic of identity recreation. They use the practice called uh, paper sense, where they would usually claim to be um, uh, the sons of somebody who is born in the United States so that they can get gain entry into the United States. Otherwise, they would not be allowed in the country. Um, so this is one version of a, of a paper son who claims somebody as a father. Of course, all of these claims were um, in the language of the United States uh, immigration services legal because, of course, that person was not the father of this child. But at the same time, the immigration authorities in the U.S. could not prove that there is no uh, that there is no link between um, the, the the parents and, and between the claimants. Um, so basically, there were a lot of these examples where, um, because the the Constitution of the United States would allow for U.S. citizens to bring their offspring, even if they are born uh, somewhere else, the Chinese use that as an opportunity to um, to claim identities that they didn't have. Now, something which is extremely important in the invention of identity is that it's not enough to just invent an identity. You also have to assert and claim it. Right? So what happened with the Chinese is that the moment you say that you're that you have a new name, a new birth date, um, a, new, a new family, you have to continue maintaining it as long as you're on that territory. So um, with this process, they, in, in a way, also created a new life, a new beginning for themselves. And that was always done for the purposes of being able to go back and forth, to circulate between China and the United States, because many of them never really settled in either one of the places. Um, what also this um, uh, possibility of, of methods did, and I'm going back to Odysseus here, is that um, just as I told you in the story, Odysseus decides to um, give uh, wine to, to the Cyclops in order to intoxicate him and to um, pierce him in the eye. You'll say, why not kill him? Well. If Odysseus was to kill the Cyclops, he would not be able to lift the big rock that's on the page. So this is an example. I use this as an example to show how, um, through Metis, you know how to subvert power to act against power itself. So you need the Cyclops, you need the power to remain strong enough in order to function for your purposes. In the same way, the Chinese migrants did not, did not want to dissolve the U.S. state. They did not want to challenge the authority of immigration because they need the, the visa entry, they need the citizenship in order to continue their own movement. But in order for that to happen, power needs to stay powerful enough. It has to stay functional enough and function against its own design. Uh, there are, of course, many other examples that you, that you can think of this. You can think, for example, of uh, um, immigrants who join the, the U.S. military in order to become U.S. citizens. And, and in that way, um, being able to, to get the citizenship, although they're typically uh, um, classified otherwise as having an illegal entry. Now, um, something else which um, uh, comes from all of this analysis is also that um, the institution uh, of the state, um, the, the immigration authority, usually controls migrants in two ways, temporality and uh, locality. And migrants are able to disturb both of these. Temporality by first and foremost changing, let's say, their birthday. Right? Um, uh, able to say that, um, claiming that, let's say, a 13-year-old child is a 17-year-old man. Uh, locality by uh, by being able to say that the places that they are born is uh, some invented other place that they actually didn't um, even get to visit. So it's not even on, and only 
a locality that's within um, uh, the state, it's the U.S. state itself, but also just any other invented locality of, of their own. And this is um, also shown very well in the Odyssey, where um, the idea of temporality and locality is completely displaced. You cannot measure time um, unless you spend a lot of hours reading and reading the chapters, of course, or you cannot really identify the precise locations of his travels because Odysseus, in our terminology, is usually lost, right? And a lot of times he's lost. This is what migrants would call just circulation because they're not interested in getting from point A to point B. They're interested, and this is what's the case with Odysseus, he's interested in maintaining movement. And we always encounter him at moments when he continues moving. And this is what I argue is the primary um, contention of migrants, the ability to continue circulating, the ability of continuing movement. They're not necessarily so interested only in resettlement, the way we like to think of them. Uh, the way we think of them having rights, having the citizenship, and so on and so forth. Maybe there is more to that conversation that we need to think of. Um, this is, again, I mean, another example of, of circulations, um, particularly for the Chinese, but again, um, there has been a lot of research on migrant circulations also from, from Europe as well. So, um, in order to conclude, uh, just just to say a, a few words, um, number one, um, the way um, I, I, I like to think of, of, this, of, of this contest is that this is a, a productive contest, a contest, a, a contest that allows for the formulation of, of different social realities, of different identities, of different uh, beginnings. And um, at the same time, this is a contest that is not driven by um, political mobilization the way we think of political mobilization. It's not, um, it's not driven through rebellion, and it's not driven through um, street protests. Usually what migrants need to do first and foremost is to use the language and the grammar of the state and to convert that language, that grammar, to their own um, interests, but at the same time maintain it at, at the grammar of the state so, so that the state understands what they're saying um, as well. Um, and also, um, in terms of, of, the, of the limits and the boundaries that, that we can think um, and for how democratic spaces can be constituted, Perhaps um, the case of the migrant also shows, or maybe will allow us to think of, of the possibility of, of constitution of, of associations and the constitutions of, of different beginnings that are not territorially located. So perhaps we, we need to start thinking, not necessarily in, in transnational democracy terminology or constitutional terminology, cosmopolitan democracy terminology, but to think of democracy that is not based on, on territory. Because territory is something that is occupied by the state. And there is no way to get around the institutionalization of the state. Thank you. So, Owen Thomas will uh, present the comments. He's a PhD candidate at the University of Exeter in the UK, and uh, his research lies at the intersection between political theory, British foreign policy, and international relations. His thesis examines how the relationship between publicity and security is practiced in British state sponsored public inquiries intended to scrutinize controversial foreign policy. For the uh, spring 2013 semester, um, Owen is an economic and social research uh, council of, uh, founded visiting scholar of the new school with us, that is. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, for that introduction. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, to all the authors of their papers. I very, very much enjoyed reading them. Um, hopefully what I'm going to say is going to tie a little bit into the discussions of the very first panel as well. 
in terms of what we've spoken about uh, the imminent relations of our uh, democracy and thinking beyond status thinking. Um, now, I think all these papers do two things very, very clearly. First of all, all the papers identify forms of political violence um, and inclusive exclusion brought about through the constitution of a border or a frontier. And I mean inclusive exclusion in this Agamemnonite sense. In order to be meaningfully excluded, the subject has to be included within the regime of power in some way. And the borders or the frontier that's described in these papers are not necessarily spatial, but they're not virtual, temporal, discursive, but they are a condition of existence for the papers failure to state nonetheless. Secondly, all of these papers outline practices that in some sense could be described as radically democratic, that may provide a means to challenge the necessity of this West Valley limit as a necessary apparatus for the political community, and in some way overcome this violence that we can identify. I'm going to go through each paper and identify a couple of questions or all points for the authors. And I'm also going to try and raise a couple of broad questions that I hope will tie them together. I'm going to start with a, with a very broad question. A couple of the papers draw on um, Foucault for the analytic of power that they use. And I think one of the striking implications for Foucault's analytic of power is that acts of resistance or contestation of power often end up reinforcing a broader strategy of power. And the question that these papers raise, but I think are also occasionally troubled by, is whether acts of democratic resistance can actually reinforce the apparatus of the border or the frontier that in some way they seek to contest. So I'll, I'll, I'll begin with um, Julia uh, Amosala's paper. And the paper introduces the indefinite exile of Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. And the refugees are denied the same rights and services as Lebanese citizens. And the paper identifies two forms of action for these refugees, assimilation or pariahdom. <clears throat> assimilation entails attempting to integrate into another society, if that's possible. And, and I think Julia draws out very nicely that it's not always clear that, that refugees do have a choice. Whilst pariahdom would entail accepting the challenge and responsibility of being an outsider, remaining in the margins of society, embracing one's difference, and fighting for full political and legal recognition. So on the one hand, the paper draws out a quite a neat critique of assimilation. Assimilation entails an acceptance of the sovereign nation state as the only model for inclusion. Once assimilated, any claim for the right of return tends to take place in the context of a shared state or two-state solution that is already buying into, and I point the paper here, accepting the illegal settler occupation of Palestine. On the other hand, the riot would seem to reject these claims and entail a struggle for identity that doesn't start with that model. And I just want to push a little bit further with this. So what does Pariahdom actually practically entail? And how would we know it when we see it? How do we distinguish a productive provider from simply the inability to uh, assimilate? Is it a case of bringing a political claim to difference to the public sphere? Or does pride entail actively refusing to participate in certain ways? I think there's an interesting uh, parallel here between um, this paper and um, Andreas's paper in terms of the refugee camp in Vienna. And I wonder whether you might consider these uh, refugees to be constituting some kind of pride in themselves. So I'll move on to, um, I'm going to get slightly out of order now, because this, this is the order I wrote the papers in. Um, Andreas uh, overcomes up his uh, paper. And in this sense, the, the focus is not so much on the border, but on the frontier, which is belonging to no one, as the paper tells us, and a place in which jurisdiction and accountability of the state practices are suspended. And the implications, I think, as you drew up during our first frontier, are quite clear. And so we've got German cabinets who don't see public accountability or jurisdiction for what the Frontex operations are doing. Um, and I just want to pick up on the second scenario that you gave, the way in which you might, you might think about democratizing the frontier. And maybe say a bit more about it. You spoke about these forensic oceanographers who are attempting to overcome a void of responsibility in the Mediterranean Ocean by gathering empirical data for a public audience so that they can hold European states to account and ensure accountability and jurisdiction of the Mediterranean Sea, where previously states may have just chosen to ignore migrants drifting for days and days. And on the one hand, this is, this is, this is tied to a cosmopolitan project of transnational, the transnational sphere. But I was thinking, isn't it also reinforcing the idea that it's the responsibility of the nation states to govern these spaces at all? And by requiring that the governments are accountable and have jurisdiction for the frontier, 
this seems as if there's a risk that we might support the extension of the state itself. Um, and is that going to help or hinder the passage of migrants, and to say, preventing people without valid documentation from becoming citizens? The paper seems to yearn for a democratic politics that can challenge the appropriation of territory and the exclusion of individuals once all free land is appropriated. But doesn't extending jurisdiction and accountability risk intensify a state driven choice of who is admitted to the business? Uh, let's now turn to Andres uh, Hetzel's paper. And this paper is particularly concerned with a violent border of European apartheid. And one of the driving forces we can see behind this violence is the nomus that distinguishes between those that can be included and those who are excluded. Radical democracy, the paper suggests, lies in negating these practices, which are required by the nation state, the interest of capital. The possibility for moving beyond this nomos of the nation state lies in, and I quote the paper here, the European demos that rejects classification based on the criteria of nation or European citizenship. A European public that doesn't include or exclude on the basis of this may provide radical possibilities and stop what is piling up to overcome this violence of European data. I think there's a spectre though that needs to be confronted in, in, in this, and I think it's hinted at at the very end, where Andreas Hetzel remarks that we must ask, however, by which criteria the cosmopolitanism of these institutions can be measured, and whether such criteria do not hold the danger of new exclusions. And I think the spectre in this paper is Kant. And from Kant's essays when writing them forward, there have always been claims on behalf of reason as to what constitutes a reasonable and a publicly unreasonable claim, and what doesn't. I mean, the point made by Foucault, distinguishing humanism from enlightenment, and then by scholars such as Mitchell Dean, is that as soon as you introduce criteria for public reason in the public sphere, you start to introduce a new norms. And the paper seeks a public deliberation without the need for citizen papers, uh, or many of the criteria for, for bourgeois membership in the public sphere. But I wonder, is it ever possible to constitute a public sphere or design public deliberation in such a way that doesn't exclude some public or reasonable behaviour? Um, and one answer may be that it's an emergency of consequence of knowledge power. But I just want to push at what the possible implications of this might be, or very good conclusion about the possible reintroduction of new exclusions in the cosmopolitan project. And finally, I just want to say a few words about um, uh, Maria Canetti's paper. Really points rather than questions, but I hope they'll provide a, 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 a positive basis for the discussion. Through a very engaging and interweaved discussion of Metis in Odysseus's actions and the strategies uh, of change in Chinese migratory practices in the US, the paper challenges our understanding of migration as necessary a form of immigration and challenges the superiority of the state as an unassailable guardian of such immigration. First of all, I'd say that I mean, it seems to me that the empirical factors you're identifying are very typical, and you said this, of uh, the 19th and 20th century, very much paper based. But I think the critique that you could provide could just as easily be applied to uh, biometric digital border controls today. And there's some interesting work out there that suggests that uh, migrants are just as capable of fooling the digital biometric machine as they do the paper based machine. And, I'm gonna, and, and it's important for what I'm going to say next. Um, I think there's a very interesting kernel of political democracy and a critique of Westphalian state sovereignty in the paper. You note that Odysseus is a hero because he never settles. And the narrative goes against the concept and the constitution of the state. And so that Metis and movement pose an immense threat to sovereign authority. And I really like the story that you tell of Zeus. You say that in order to ensure his omnipotence and omniscience, Zeus does not destroy but swallows his wife Metis. So Metis can't bear a son that would destroy Zeus. Now Zeus has the power to control production, reproduction, and power. And so the, re the, the reproduction of Metis by the migrants challenges this dynamic. And in your words, the contestation and disruption of Metis is not paralyzing, and annihilating, or disabling, but generative meanings and definitions. And it's got me thinking about um, the, the kind of political treaties that emerged in the uh, 16th century or so, that um, set the basis for a modern European state that emphasized the importance of acquiring factual knowledge about the state. Not just prescriptive knowledge about virtues, but mundane knowledge about what the resources of the state are. Its size, its capabilities, 
including most of the population. And this knowledge is important for the state because it grants the state the ability to imagine possible actions that it can take in response to the future. The state can plan, it can know what it has, what it can do. The state controls the future. Your identification of metics as a political practice in the ancient world and today challenges the strategy of governments. It takes away the ability of the state to know what it has and what it can do. So in terms of radical democracy then, if the state doesn't have a monopoly over control of matters, we're faced with a multitude who can come and go without impediments and ever-changing demands. We're talking about the reintroduction of constituent power that is free to constitute structures of governments, abandon them, and then return at will. And perhaps we might consider the radical potential of Bryden, the resistance to the frontier, and the European demos without a nonce as grounded in exactly this principle that the state cannot hold a monopoly on movement, on who can be known as a citizen and who cannot. It may be challenging precisely that epistemological hubris of the state to know who is and who is not licit might be a part of to radical democracy at the border. Thank you. I think um, uh, the participants should respond uh, that quickly because we don't have much time and uh, it's important to also have a discussion. So in three, four minutes, each one of you, two, three minutes, each one of you, just to address some of the points and then to move quickly and open up the discussion. Uh, we can start from, uh, from the end, then, Marina. And then um, Owen, thank you very much for really great comments and thank you for bringing back the story of Zeus that um, didn't have time to discuss here. Um, I, I completely agree with your point that one of the uh, main prerogatives of the state is, is controlling the future and, and migrants uh, definitely disturb temporality. Um, of course, the, I would also say that the story is not as rosy or optimistic as we would like it to be because, of course, Zeus swallows Metis, um, the state learns from migrants' practices and incorporates them into new forms of regulating uh, migration control, definitely. Uh, but uh, I think there's always the potential of, of disturbing uh, the state practices and, and that's why I, I like to maintain that opposition of movement versus settlement. Thank you so much for, for this close reading, for this accurate reading, and for bringing up once again also um, my own my very personal concern. I, I would like to, to, to agree with uh, Marina and, 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 and argue that for Foucault there is no transcendence in, in terms of something beyond power relations. I think that in this case he also agrees, or that Hannah Arendt would very much agree with, that with Foucault at the moment when she's saying that political change needs power, the kids of math, as opposed to, ge to Gewalt, she also argues that uh, politics, democratic politics, needs power relations. And I think this, this uh, well-known sentence, where there's power, there's resistance, is not necessarily an inference in terms of uh, we have power, and we have necessarily resistance, but it can also be probably turned around. Where there's resistance, there's also power. And the question is, uh, how do also actors who cannot um, count on, on a particular residence uh, of permit, um, well, embody, embody power. What, what kind of power is this? It's, it's certainly also a game, but at the same time would also say there's a, a particular experience involved. Um, the experience of, uh, of presenting oneself as a political subject, which is to a certain extent also making a difference. People who are involved in, in the refugee strikes, people who were attending uh, the, uh, the first European March of the Undocumented were saying this was an incredible experience for us. For the first time we, we came out, well, in, in this context we came out in the Bali, for the first time we were crossing uh, uh, Switzerland. And, and this created also a, a strange situation because uh, in this European March of the Undocumented you had people coming together from different uh, European countries, from Italy, um, France, um, Germany, uh, but they were also cutting through Switzerland and uh, the border patrols of Switzerland knew that this was happening. They knew that some people would come along and cross uh, the borders and they didn't know what to do. 
And uh, at the end, uh, the, the parliamentarian said, well, better don't do anything, because if something will happen at the border, then uh, in moral terms, we as Switzerland will, uh, will uh, witness a defeat. So just don't do as if, as if nothing happens. And um, so there was also a space of experience that was created, uh, connected with the experience of subjectivity and of agency. And I think this makes, this makes certainly uh, a difference. This brings me also to the point, to what extent uh, isn't also the, the effort of uh, this uh, project like forensic oceanography reinforcing again uh, a state policy in the state practice? And it is certainly an effort of creating accountability, but I think it's not, this accountability is not necessarily linked to state practices. Uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, Charles Heller and Zani are trying to respond to a concern of the European Parliament. And in the European Union, you have also this tension between the European Council and the European Parliament. The European Parliament also trying to represent another understanding of the democracy as compared to the understanding of the European Council, which is the body of the ministers uh, of the different European governments. And so uh, forensic oceanography is trying to take sides also with the European Parliament, but also the European March of the Undocumented was addressing the European Parliament by trying to, to find also other political actors who are not directly representing states and to form alliances. And so in this sense, I would definitely um, have the hope that something changes also. Yeah, thank you for your question. Very, very uh, important and, and a good question. So, so one is, um, I mean, yeah, there's a problem, these, these two options, assimilation and then Brian Jones. So are you accepting the uh, findings the state uh, logic and gaining acceptance of legal rights through that, or are you resisting? Um, so the problem, of course, in my case, the, in this, this paper, is that this situation cannot be solved before the situation between Israel and occupied Palestine has been solved. So the problem here is that these are it, it's a form of apartheid that's not only practiced by the Israeli government, it's also the Lebanese government. So these camps, or wherever they have to be, I would call it a form of apartheid in different ways. Um, so then the question is, what is your second question? When do we know when this has been, like, or how do you recognize it, uh, uh, like a successful way of being a pariah? So I think, like in for example, in Arendt's own writings, there's no there's no clear definition of what it means, uh, and there's different ways of uh, assimilating people. So one is, for example, forcing them to be invisible. So and and the other one is to forcing them to assimilate into a major group. So what I would say is that the the question here is very complex, and what would probably be the best solution would first at least to have these refugees get some kind of proper documents so they can have at least access to healthcare, work, education within the living society. But the question is, and why some of these people are concerned about this, is that if this happens, then does that mean that they will be kind of like swallowed into the living society and then they can forget about the right to return, which is very important to them. And that's why I said that the, a very obviously complex situation in Israel has to be solved and the international community has to step in and do something about this. Before that, nothing can happen. Of course, I don't have an answer to this. However, there are many different uh, examples of successful pariah dome, I would say. One of them, one example that Arendt herself takes up in the uh, origins of totalitarianism, there's a chapter on which is comparing early forms of anti-Semitism and the situation of homosexuals. So she's talking about Cruz. But if you think about, for example, the current liberation movement of not only gay people, but for example, transgender people, that's a resistance uh, towards the state logic, which is somehow similar to the to the figure of the uh, paperless person. Because you are not one or the other, and whichever identity you are forced to choose is either you are assimilating or are you trying to get rights as the person you are. So I would say there's been a lot of success in, in those forms of uh, ways of uh, not assimilating, but trying to get legal and political recognition <coughs> as the person that you are. So that's what the pariahum is about. No matter if it's a stateless person or a refugee or whoever, it's like you're trying to get the 
well, in this case, the state to recognize it as, as that particular person or identity that you have to speak for. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely something worth thinking about. Yes, thank you very much for, for, for this uh, difficult uh, question. Um, if I um, uh, understand you right, um, your question um, is, a, is a question about uh, the status of normativity in, in my uh, argument and, and what, what could give us some normative orientation would be a uh, claim for democratization of, of borders and I reject uh, kind of universal normos uh, concept, because I, I uh, want to stress that um, every uh, um, yeah, universal principle or law principle or um, um, moral principle always uh, produces uh, new forms of, of uh, exclusion. And, and if you uh, just refer to, to human rights or to, to um, what principle ever, you, you, you uh, can always use this principle uh, to, to show that, that some um, people don't follow this principle. And, and so this is also a Karl Schmidt argument in, in, in the, uh, the numbers of, of the earth. And, and, uh, but uh, if I say this, then the question, what, what uh, can we do? Uh, and, and, uh, I uh, don't really have a, um, a good answer. Maybe it's an answer which also uses the concept of metis, a kind of uh, ethical metis, uh, which means that, that we um, can only uh, get some orientation from, from uh, um, yeah, uh, real forms of, of uh, resistance, real, real forms of, of suffering um, and uh, of yeah, so that, that um, we have to, to um, uh, do something like maybe uh, uh, also s s um, social theorists do, if they don't do grounded theory. We have to, to um, uh, yeah, to, to um, find our normative ori orientation within the field, within the, the people um, uh, who, who suffer uh, from, from, uh, from borders. And, and we cannot, uh, do it from the from point of no, nowhere and, and just uh, define uh, uh, principles and, and uh, the universal reason and, and uh, yeah, or, or maybe universal institutions. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, maybe just Let's uh, begin the discussion again. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for a very, for very interesting papers. I have one general question to everybody, and one particular to Marina. Uh, maybe I start with a particular question to Marina. Uh, you said that the migrant is the one that is in, a, or if not in a constant movement, that at least is the interested in maintaining movement. And my question is, how would that differ from a nomad or vagabond? Um, because I think that these, uh, I mean, that there is a big, big difference between a migrant and uh, and a nomad. Uh, and more general question slash comment is that all of you um, criticized uh, or critiqued uh, borders uh, uh, with the assumption that the, the the sovereignty is the state sovereignty. What what if we think about sovereignty? as constituent power, popular constituent power, right? Um, we still would need uh, some kind of borders that would demarcate uh, different popular uh, subject, the democratic subjects. Um, I mean, this is a very broad and very open question, but can we, could you think about democratic borders when it, if they were established in a different way, not top down by the sovereign state, uh, but bottom up by uh, collective popular subjects. Yes. Marina? Um, I mean, th thank you for the question. I, I haven't thought about other forms of. of uh, of identification by the state of people who are not part of the state. So you, okay. can, you can simply say that a nomad and a vagabond are, in, in my understanding, um, persons who are also not within the limits of, or outside of the state. 
so um, they could easily, particularly the nomads, could easily be also, in this sense, be defined as migrants. My definition of a migrant is very broad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To me, this will be just a different state categorization of mm -hmm. people who participate in the same type of do we want to, to discuss uh, the second question, the broader question about alternative conceptual democratic conceptualization of uh, territorial demarcations? Andres? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm living at the moment also this particular European experience that, um, I mean, I think, for example, of uh, what Mario Draghi, the president of the European Central Bank, said, I mean, the, the, the European welfare state has ended. Uh, obviously, it's, it's, uh, it's an absurd statement, but nonetheless, there is a particular, I would say, experience, a widespread use experience that uh, the state, at, at least as the embodiment of a particular political promise, is not that visible anymore, is not presenting itself anymore with that uh, promise, uh, at least not um, in this space that we could consider European. So I'm, I'm very much with, with Foucault, would be very much careful to, to place the state uh, at the center of the attention. I mean, this, the state is have, certainly there, but it's connected with a, with a variety of other logics uh, as well. And it's, it's not just a, a unique and one-dimensional apparatus. Uh, also a contradicting apparatus uh, linked to different interests, etc., etc. And so, first of all, this would be my personal answer. I would not so much focus on, on the state at the moment for understanding um, let's say the, re the regimes of mobility or the permeability of political community. Um, but obviously, uh, this brings us to the question, how do we understand and how could we possibly understand the sovereignty? The moment we use expressions like popular power, it involves already the question, well, I mean, who is part of the people? I mean, since uh, a lot of, especially theorists um, close to radical democratic thought are usually also arguing that the very expression of the people is a contested expression. It's a double expression. According to Georgia Gandhi, you have the, uh, the popolo grasso and the popolo minuto. So who is representing uh, already the, 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 the power expression contained in, in the term uh, uh, the, the people? Um, and I, I think that the case of uh, those without uh, papers uh, is, is interesting because you have an unqualified multitude of people who are coming together uh, with them. Um, and they are obviously also um, presenting themselves as a subject, but they don't present themselves as one particular people anymore. This brings up the question, what does sovereignty in this context uh, mean? And, and, and I would like just to remind this, this discussion that has taken place between uh, Ben Habib, Uxela Ben Habib and, uh, and Ross, or it's a one-dimensional discussion because Ben Habib is questioning some of the concepts of Ross, but she's pointing out that Ross is reproducing this narrow and limited idea of, of a political community which for contingent reason has inherited <coughs> certain borders and according to Ross has the necessity therefore to reproduce these borders without any question. This is the argument of Ross in his international law. And she's arguing we are nowadays in a situation where the state is not that main actor, is in, in some kind of a crisis. This doesn't mean for her that we should give up the idea of uh, not defining permeability and belonging, but at least we should question what extent we can trust that there is a state or to what extent there is a people uh, and we should try to, to approach this, this situation more carefully. Yeah, I'm just going to point out that in my paper, maybe the case is extreme because one borders are, not my, but the borders that I'm talking about are military checkpoints and literally brick and cement walls and controls and things like that. So in my case, probably anything would be better than this kind of conceptual sort of anything. So turning this upside down, uh, of course, would be ideal. But then, then I like your question, but it's very important to remember what you do when you're theorizing something and asking questions in the context of theory, and then what is actually happening on the ground. You know, like, so, so that's why I also am interested in this whole conception of radical democracy, because it goes from grassroots to up and vice versa, and it's very important to question these things. Um, I don't know, in, in, in this case, uh, I mean, Arendt's ideal was already in 1948 that there would be some kind of a federated Mediterranean uh, confederation between different kinds of, you know, territories that are connected to different kinds of uh, 
power structures and different kinds of uh, participatory things. But this was her ideal way back. Um, in terms of, can we think about nationalities without the borders, then the Palestinian refugees are one example because they're scattered in Syria, Lebanon, uh, Israel, all over the world, and they have a very strong sense of belonging, national belonging, that's not tied necessarily to, to the traditional conception of the, to the nation states. So those are some examples, but thank you for the question, it's very important. Well, um, I think two quick questions, uh, one to this Andreas and one to the other Andreas. Um, so this, um, I think it's very important to think beyond the concept of the border uh, for lots of the reasons that have emerged. Uh, but another more political <coughs> background reason is the concept of the border seems very much tied, the liberal concept of the border is very much tied to the uh, post post state. <coughs> Essentially, uh, the border is where my law stop, stops and yours starts. And that's why we have authors have done from things at the world. Now, okay, a concept, as you point out, that doesn't have that kind of politics is frontier. Uh, frontier is where, frontier is an imperial concept. It's where my law is not established yet. Uh, the Western frontier. Uh, empires have frontiers. Now, it, it, this is not just a question of words, uh, because we need that concept. Uh, an example from Israel. Perfect. Israel is an imperial state. Um, and the idea that the laws are part of the state, not a border, is, I think, very, very important. So I query your use of the word, I didn't query the examples, I query the concept of the country. You need something else in that. Uh, and, and I think, basically, that area needs to be thought of very deeply, simply that. Uh, it's a question of the nature of ter territory, the relation between territory and politics in the contemporary world. And that's just, we haven't got anything, but we have not clear what that relationship and those relationships are. Um, second point about the democratization of borders. Um, I take Abazad's point, uh, but I don't want to take it too far. Um, it's easy in principle to imagine a democratic settlement of border disputes. You've got one democracy within borders and some kind of other democratic institutions of a global or continental divide which sets the borders democratically in some deeply different way. The point is, what I was wrong with that, principle, that working that out is the question of borders in some past the dead and the future, those who are not born. They concern the dead because of the um, ways in which borders were established. They concern the legitimacy of the current borders. They concern the future because borders are for the future. It's very difficult to find a democratic way of representing the past. <coughs> I have to be brief because of many questions. <laughs> yeah. um, but I mean, I, I agree um, very much with what uh, Weizmann himself says about uh, frontier regimes. Uh, for him, this is first of all a, a spatial concept and the method of, of understanding what is taking place. But at the same time, he's absolutely clear about this. These are treacherous zones. Uh, um, and, and elastic territories uh, are by no means um, secured zones, but the zones of insecurity. And, and he's also pointing out, and I think this is also revealing, that um, the Israeli Defense Forces, they're using concepts um, developed by Guattari and Deleuze in A Thousand Plateaus um, uh, in order to imagine new situations of warfare, uh, of situations that are multidimensional, etc., etc. So it becomes quite visible and, and uh, in, in the argumentation of Weizmann that uh, none of the so-called post-structuralist efforts of reimagining political space is um, benevolent as such, but it can be definitely used uh, in aggressive terms. Uh, and for me, again, it's, it's, it's mainly it has to do with the effort of translating what Weizmann is saying with regard to Israel and transferring it to a certain extent to, to Europe and to see to what extent 
Europe can also be understood nowadays as some kind of a hollow, uh, a holy union, union in the sense of uh, of not be, not really being demarcated. Uh, of, on the one hand, uh, disbanding uh, classical borders, but at the same time of uh, reproducing and generalizing control situations, um, uh, privileging some and uh, disenfranchising uh, others. So it's, it's, it's an effort, on the one hand, for me to, to expose what is happening in order to critically also engage with those micropolitics that are already taking place that are challenging these frontiers. So for me, the frontiers need to, need to be challenged, but they also need to be taken seriously in, in, in terms of, uh, of uh, governmental uh, dispositives. It, it's, it's an effort. I think it's a very interesting question. Uh, maybe uh, I uh, just uh, focus on the, the future aspect because I think um, if, you, if we talk about democratization of a, uh, of a border, we have the paradox that there is not yet uh, any subject for this uh, project. It's a uh, subject to come. This demos had to be uh, constituted by, by learning that the border not only divides us but, but also relates us in, in uh, some way. That we are both um, uh, subjected um, uh, as, as uh, insiders and as outsiders by this, this, this border. So, so the, the border is also a, a, a chance for a for future of a, a, yeah, a new form of uh, uh, a community which which is not defined by criteria of um, uh, race or, or language or uh, whatever. The, the, the border as such uh, is uh, uh, that which, which divides us is also something which uh, relates us in some way and, and gives us a chance to, to uh, get the process of, of deliberation and, and conflict and, and so on. Because we have uh, several questions, uh, I will divide them uh, uh, in groups of two, and uh, hopefully we can have um, uh, brief, uh, brief uh, comments. Uh, so the first two is uh, Mehmet and uh, Gerasimus. Since I'm too short, I'll stand up. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm repeating something, because I couldn't hear all the questions and answers, but uh, it seems to me that the... I, First of all, I enjoyed all the presentations, very interesting, but it seems to me that the, the concept of border has not been thought more, or should be thought more dialectically, as something that contains its opposites within itself. So in most of the, what, what I heard, it seems that what, when you're excluded from the border, the border being excluded has the negative consequence. Um, and I just want to be very brief by giving a short example. It seems that in many cases of exclusion, the exclusion itself um, brings about emancipatory potential and freedom. So not everyone who is exclude, excluded by the border is necessarily, or some, I mean, we need to assume a standard by which we say people who are excluded. And it seems like most of the presentations impose a standard. And there might be another standard by which you can think of exclusion as um, creating another space uh, that is potentially emancipatory. And perhaps, thinking about Palestinian camps, they have been in hotbeds of emancipatory revolutionary movement, despite the horrible conditions. And not the so, uh, I was wondering if you would like to reflect on the emancipatory potential of that from exclusion. Yes. I have a question for Marina. I, um, I think this is a it's very innovative. Your use of uh, Odysseus and its approach is very innovative. And uh, I, I found uh, your connection between resistance and, and metric persuasive. But uh, I, I wonder whether uh, you, know, uh, you can assume that strongly the connection between metrics and, and democracy. Uh, metrics is a quality of uh, resistance, yes, those who resist state authority. But you know, uh, criminals also um, uh, employ metrics, and uh, they don't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, not necessarily embrace uh, our democratic uh, perspective. So I think one thing that's important to look at uh, is what the signification of autonomy is within immigrant uh, communities, uh, migrant migrant workers uh, communities, and uh, any clarification you can offer to that. Yes. 
So the first uh, question that was, I think, addressed to everyone, but... I, I can talk to both of them. Okay, but... but Fast. Fast. Okay. <laughs> uh, I absolutely agree with the comment, and, and actually in my work, I show exactly how this process of, the, of exclusion creates a lot of potentialities, because actually it's because of the exclusion that migrants can play with the um, contradictions of the state itself, because the state is actually, and this is part of the of power against power zone on design, is that there's a lot of gray areas within the institutions of the state that allow for uh, different variants of uh, creating new spaces. Uh, so absolutely, um, I definitely will highlight one uh, before this in my work. Um, I uh, completely agree with the comment, and I completely think that you're right. But first and foremost, um, migrants are usually considered criminals. They're illegal, undocumented, eating rats, and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, who, who decides who's the criminal? I'm absolutely, I also absolutely agree with you that there is the potentiality of uh, cunning, intelligence, and all of these other things that are not necessarily constituted, that they're not productive. I, I try to look into my work into the more productive, constitutive aspect of it, which probably associates with autonomy. And I will try to follow up on that more in my work. But yes. Yeah, well, just briefly. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think that's a very good point to make that the exclusion itself might create emancipatory potential. And then it's important, I think, to, just to answer is also that there's a difference between just being liberated from oppression versus the right to practice political freedom and have access to those institutions that decide on your own life and the way you're allowed to move or express yourself. So that's very important. I'm thinking about, for example, South Africa as an example. Um, on the other hand, it's also important to, to think about those uh, circumstances where this is not possible. So, for example, the example of totalitarianism. So even, even in these circumstances, there may be where the exclusion brings about emancipatory potential, then there has to be some forms of spaces or something, some ways of associating uh, in order to be able to resist this. Uh, but that's, that's another question. But, but thanks. thanks for that. Um, we have uh, two more questions, uh, if there is no other. I want also very quickly to have a comment, maybe a question to the pose in, the, in between, uh, about this idea of uh, which the people uh, that uh, uh, raise some uh, important and controversial issues. So my answer is very simple, especially related to the debate, uh, to the presentation we have here. The people are the poor. So in that sense, um, uh, the migrants, in one way or another, uh, as they exist in, in the empirical capitalist uh, uh, world we live in are definitely part uh, of the people uh, in different uh, geographical areas they find themselves in. Uh, the, the question that I have more or less about uh, the four papers that I think uh, they addressed uh, a, a similar uh, issue, but only implicitly. They didn't bring it really to the, to the surface, although I think it was central to all these papers, uh, is the question of uh, citizenship. In fact, a kind of citizenship, democratic citizenship, beyond the nation and beyond the, uh, the state st system. So on the one hand, we have the, um, uh, Marina who discussed citizenship as metis, forms of uh, subverting the state uh, and strategies uh, uh, of uh, uh, acquiring uh, uh, some rights or imposing, uh, um, uh, uh, forcing the state to acquire some rights. Um, uh, Andrea speaking about different three, three different uh, uh, strategies um, about uh, uh, creating spaces of appearance. Uh, Julia also uh, forms of resistance in uh, in camps, uh, and uh, Andreas um, uh, discussing uh, uh, the, the borders as uh, as a, um, a field, the site uh, uh, of democratic uh, contestation. But it seems to me that all these uh, uh, examples or all these approaches uh, definitely uh, point at forms of uh, political agency 
a political um, uh, intervention that uh, uh, cry out uh, for a new uh, understanding of, uh, of citizenship uh, that will be both democratic uh, and outside or beyond um, uh, the state form without being universal uh, in, in its ab abstractness. And I think it's at this point that perhaps uh, the, the idea of the, the, the constituent power of, of uh, uh, the, the, the poor might be uh, useful, but we can leave that uh, uh, to discuss maybe in the round table. So let's go to the two discussions, one and two. So my question was uh, specifically for Julia regarding um, kind of the using concentration camps as a form of resistance um, and uh, having kind of the options between like assimilating and, and taking on this identity of Koreanism, right? And so I fear that unfortunately um, the idea of Koreanism is a little simplified because so if we look at um, the the Palestinians, the, in order to resist, they also have to like accept the identity of refugee. If you were to ask uh, a Palestinian, they, they consider themselves as returnees, not reject refugees, right? So then we see like this problem with, with um, having to take on the identity of refugee, which they don't necessarily like self-identify with, right? In order to um, receive international like legitimacy as like a pariah. Um, and so this leads to like the second point of um, you, you were talking about how uh, the Palestinians are kind of separated between Syria, um, Jordan, um, Lebanon, and, and all that. And we also need to look at how their second, third, and fourth time refugees. So they'll be in Syria and then get kicked out of Syria and move to Lebanon, and then kicked out of Lebanon and move to Jordan. So they, they're going through this time and time again. Um, and I think this also brings up like the important idea, or the important fact that like they have to turn to um, like non like they they can't turn to uh, NGOs or the, the UN if they don't um, accept this refugee status right if they uh, just keep the the returnee identity um, the only kind of organizations that they can appeal to is like the PLO um, so I was wondering how like um, that idea and like further uh, complexity regarding the the identity of Brianna uh, kind of how you would respond to that? Uh, yeah. You have a question from a point of view of a historian. So, uh, refugee crisis and migration historically led to uh, construction of different legal international norms, including minority rights and after World War II, human rights. And just uh, one question. So nowadays, would you say that this concept of radical democracy evacuated uh, the language of human rights as a powerful language of political claim making? Do you use it, uh, or how do you use this notion, or does it have any place? Because it seems like you know human rights is, the kind, is this kind of unquestionable doxa, but maybe it's just you know fading away. Uh, from this, you know, landscape of uh, also radical democracy. Yeah, you want to Oh, yeah, I'm going to be brief. Thanks for your question. I'm not actually 100% sure if I got your question right, but was it that the problem is that uh, <coughs> they have to accept the refugee status in order to be even recognized? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, just one clarification. I didn't talk about concentration camps in my paper. I talked about refugee camps. No, yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. Cool. So we're... Uh, um, the thing, though, is that in... I can only speak about my experience in Lebanon and what I've read about that. The problem there is that they don't necessarily even have right to refugee status. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, children, and women especially, who are undocumented. So they have access to... Um, right. Uh, and this is because of a very complex... Um, registration system that the UN has. So for example, some of the women uh, can't pass on the refugee status to the children unless they're married. If they're divorced, they lose refugee status. Uh, I would say that they do identify themselves, the ones that I you know, do identify themselves as refugees. But your question is very, I mean, it's very important. But is this the only way to access any kind of rights? But that's exactly what I'm trying to point out in the paper, that, that if you don't have citizenship, 
and you don't have, uh, I mean, if you don't have citizenship, then you don't have access to these rights. And if you have a refugee status, you're completely dependent on these non-governmental organizations, different kinds of funding mechanisms. Uh, and I would say that it, it kind of points back to the question of, of how do we think about transnational citizenship for the Palestinians living in all these different regions, especially now, like you mentioned, the Syrian refugees are pouring in, not only Palestinians from Syria, the Syrians are pouring into Palestine, and Palestinian refugees within the camps are actually hosting Syrian refugees who are escaping from Syria. So it's, it's getting very, very chaotic. Uh, and obviously the conflict is about to spill over to Lebanon, and, and the whole Middle East is very, very shaky right now. That's why it's very important to address these questions. But I would say that the, the question is how to think about citizens, citizenship status for uh, these Palestinians living in these camps that can serve the purpose of their interest, so that they have access to those uh, laws and rules that are regulating and determining their freedom of movement and other other rights that they need to have. Just very briefly. Thank you. Uh, very short uh, try to answer the human uh, rights question. I think uh, they, uh, of course, play an important role, but uh, in, a, in, a, in a new and other forum, especially uh, Balibar, uh, is, uh, I think one of the most um, intelligent uh, uh, part of this uh, new human rights uh, discussions, and he just says, uh, of course, we, uh, this, 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 this concept is still useful, but we, we uh, must uh, transform it. We, we must uh, decolonize it. We must ask uh, who uh, declares its rights, uh, for whom, and, and uh, I think this is just, just the point. It, it's no longer a kind of transcendental frame, and, and, uh, but, but it, 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 uh, it's a, a permanent task and question. And I think he was of the Convention Against Statelessness, which is also a result of the Second World War. Um, but I'm also at the same time thinking of uh, Hannah Arendt's uh, critique of the fact of statelessness, mm -hmm. because if you consider the, the conditions of uh, the some papier, most of them are not stateless in, in the classical or in the legal sense, but they are practically they have become stateless. You know, stateless. Uh, there's this 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 uh, movie by Costa Gabras, which begins where you see person entering uh, the European Union, which are getting rid of their own papers. So there are conditions which turn people into stateless persons, not officially, but practically in, in terms of. Uh, of renouncing uh, their, their rights uh, as citizens. And, th and this brings us to the very question, uh, how, how do we imagine citizenship otherwise? Because in, in purely legal terms, you could say, well, many of these, or the European states would argue, these are citizens. The only the problem is that they are not citizens of our European states, and therefore, we should send them back. Uh, the question is, uh, how can you uh, perhaps uh, dissociate um, democratic rights connected to citizenship without the, teri the territorial delimitation of, of uh, the citizenship. I mean, Ben Habib is also working on this. I, I don't have this uh, normative drive in, in terms of uh, creating a normative system which um, exposes how this is indeed possible. I'm more interested how people are acting so that it becomes possible. But in any case, uh, citizenship is not so much just a legal concept, but it's first of all connected to spaces of appearance. Uh, and because you have also in Europe the human right to, to assemble and, and to protest, even if you are illegal. But if you're doing so, then you're... Not In Greece it doesn't exist. According to the European Court of Human Rights, it exists. But the moment you're doing so, you are basically risking yourself and you can be deported. So this is, this, this is the contradiction. I mean, you have the right, but the moment you are using, you're making use of your right, then uh, you're risking not just this or that, but you're risking yourself. And therefore, you have the, the practical contradiction of uh, something that is legally in place, but it creates a situation of de facto deportation. Because in the, in the international, uh, uh, for, for, the, for the stateless uh, people, uh, they don't have the right to, to assemble or to, to demonstrate. They have only what we call uh, individual or private rights, not political ones. They are prohibited from acting, to say, uh, acting politically, from international law. But we will talk about maybe, I'm sorry, uh, Marina, and we have one more question to... I, I really appreciate the historian question, because, and this is one of the reasons why I look at the um, kind of the conceptual creation of, of the immigration regimes, which is the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. 
when actually the language of human rights does not exist, which is also very wonderful because none of the, even the memories, which is what I'm reading, I'm reading these oral histories of people who have entered illegally, none of them phrases their um, entry into the United States in the language of rights. Yes, they talk about uh, unfairness, exclusionary laws, but nobody says, I actually should have had the right or any of that language. It's just absent. And also, if you, if you take it from there, if you look at even today the struggles of undocumented uh, migrants in the United States, they still don't use the language of, of rights. At the very best, they'll say, we entered as children, so it was not our fault. But they will still not say, we have the right because we entered as children. They'll say, it was not our fault. So uh, the US is, is very good at overlooking human sure. rights, whether it exists or not. The last question, maybe very short. That was very short. Um, it's, it's also considering the citizenship issue that's been taking place in this uh, discussion. And my question, I think, is basically more for Marina and Andreas. Um, how can, I agree and I, 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 I thank you for being a, with a much broader aspect of immigration, not as only as people trying to be assimilated or not being assimilated, but it's a much more wider discussion and that's just really good. But try and play the devil's advocate in the sense, how can, in the case of Marina's uh, uh, presentation, how can this immigrant circularity, uh, which in one sense can avoid the state's repression in a way, or, or, or allow themselves to, to, to play within, but not uh, against or towards, helps uh, uh, the possibility of immigrants getting citizenship, not only in a legal way, but only in a, in a broader sense. I mean, how is this? non-contestation, publicly speaking, can allow immigrants to, at the same time, demand rights. Uh, I would I, I would argue that in, in the United States there's a lot of cases of immigrant uh, uh, communities and organizations that are actually asking for rights, especially workers' rights. You have domestic workers in, in, in New York, you have the more uh, people that are, you know, I think that's, there's, there's something about that. And in the other sense, uh, for Andrea, um, it's, it's following up the same thing. How can we think about getting rights with people that are not, in a sense, openly there, but that, that the state is always thinking about them? And I come back to the New York example. The stop and frisk is a very clear example of how uh, the state is operating against a certain pattern of people racially discriminated, mainly African Americans and Africans and Latinos, and so that you have them all the time there. So how, how can we think about this type of immigrants who are not showing themselves all the time in the public space uh, can allow themselves to create more rights for them. So, please. Uh, so, I'm not quite sure that I understand the question, but are you asking how what I'm presenting can work potentially for others who want to use it? Uh, how can that be useful for uh, in the whole society, for instance, yeah. not the state, not only to recognize the immigrants possibly, you know, to, to move around, but to actually change their status in, the, in this citizenship discussion. So, so one one of the easiest ways that people do it, the two very easy ways that people do it today, they marry. Okay. So you you juxtapose two institutions, the institution of immigration versus the institution of the family. So you're illegal, but you get married. In in five years, you get your um, green card. People do it all the time. The other the other way to do it is through um, the military. Okay? You undocumented uh, immigrants go into the military, go to Iraq, and then become citizens. Also done all the time. So this is within this uh, juxtaposing or creating uh, antinomies in, in the U.S. Very quick uh, answer. Uh, first of all, I think that if you consider that indeed millions of people, both in Europe and the United States, uh, with, uh, without any uh, residence permit, I, I don't think that the United States or, or European countries have really, uh, let's say, the means and the interests of a mass deportation, but rather they have the interest in creating a, 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 a 
a sensation that if you expose yourself, you could be deported or you will be deported. And so most of the people, they, they remain in, in spaces of disappearance. Uh, I think this is the major effect, not, not a real threat of deporting all the millions, uh, because they are also economically too much involved. And, uh, and in terms of how are those spaces of appearance created, I would say they are already created in many, in many different terms. Uh, I could also think of, uh, of the El, Gra El, El Grambaro Estadounidense here, for example, or the many refugee strikes that get, get increasingly interconnected. Uh, and I think the more people see that this can happen and that this is happening, they are also risking something, they are more prepared to risk something. And so I would say, yeah, in terms of micropolitics, let's also orient ourselves what is happening and, and what is indeed possible. In this very positive note, let's yeah. thank these excellent presentations.